In 2014, mistakes at the helm, negligent modifications to the ship, combined with the overloading and instability of cargo, led to the capsizing of the MVC Wall Ferry off the coast of South Korea. The subsequent cowardice and total absence of leadership in the most critical moments of this crisis led to an abysmal attempt at rescue and the tragic loss of more than 300 innocent lives. It was a foggy April evening in 2014 at the port of Incheon in South Korea. The Incheon passenger terminal saw the Roll-On Roll-Off or Roro Ferry MVC wall loading cargo and boarding passengers for this route, Incheon to Jeju Island and back up to three times weekly since roughly spring of 2013. Jeju Island, home of Halasan National Park, Seongsan Sunrise Peak, the dormant volcano crater, and many other similar attractions, is a popular destination for families, tourists, and especially field trips from South Korean schools. 325 students and roughly a dozen staff from Danwon High School, a public school in the city of Ansan, would board the MVC wall bound for a fun school getaway on the island. This particular trip for high school students of this age being a major event and somewhat of a rite of passage as it's multiple days away from home. The ferry, due to depart by 1830, wouldn't get underway until roughly 2100 hours, two and a half hours later than planned, due to a heavy prevailing fog. Even the voyage to the island, though, was typically an event in itself. Being a roughly 13-hour journey meant the evening departure would see passengers spending the night aboard the vessel with a mid-morning arrival. Passengers typically granted sleeping berths for the voyage or simple bedding accommodations with multiple bunks in each cabin. The kids on board spent their evening dining and even enjoying fireworks launched from the ship's decks, many using their smartphones for pictures. It was, after all, 2014, so the large majority of passengers were carrying modern cell phones. And hugging the Korean coast along the way, cell service was known to be available along much of the route. The next morning at around 0800 hours, breakfast was served as the vessel transited the Mangal Channel, while most passengers remained in their cabins. The channel, a shortcut roughly 11 miles to the southwest of Jindo Island, was notorious for its undercurrents requiring much experience to navigate safely. Their destination now only two and a half hours to the south, traveling at their current speed of 18 knots, Jeju Island was just over 50 miles away. But as the seawall was exiting the channel, the vessel made a series of turns, one turn so abrupt it exceeded the vessel's restoring force. At this speed and at such a degree, the final turn, thought to be at 849, caused a 20 degree list to port. The vessel was listing to this side so severely, cargo containers and vehicles began sliding, falling, and piling up on the port side, exacerbating the already nearly unrecoverable condition. The massive vessel's restoring point was now greatly exceeded, or the point where the center of gravity has been pushed far enough that the ship could no longer right itself. The ferry began taking on water via bow and stern doors at first, and then open doors, hatches, and windows along the C and D decks on the port side. In the meantime, though, while extremely sharp turns for a vessel of this size, in some instances, in the beginning stages of a large ship capsizing, it's a relatively slow and not overtly concerning situation, at least from the passenger's perspective, who are, by all accounts, at the mercy of the crew's guidance, especially during such an emergency, and for miners, even more so. Continuing to take on water and its subsequent rollover progressing unabated, the passengers would continue to be told via PA announcements from crew members to put on life preservers but quote, stay put and remain in their cabins. The only communication many would receive from those with authority to guide evacuations. At 8.52, a Danwon school student, Choi Duk Ha, made the first call to Korea's National Emergency Services number 119. The student reported via their cell phone the seawall was capsizing and the call was transferred to the Republic of Korea's Coast Guard station at Mok Po. Three minutes later at 8.55, the first mate placed the vessel's first official distress call from the bridge. This call would be placed at Jeju Island Station, however. 
the first mate had forgotten their two and a half hour delayed departure and reported their position as being near their destination, two and a half hours to the south, rather than the stricken vessel's actual position just southwest of Jindo Island. Between 0900 and 930, patrol vessel 123 and two helicopters dispatched from the Mokpo Coast Guard Station arrived on scene along with one helicopter from Coast Guard Cutter 3009, the cutter stationed 70 miles away. On scene, mass confusion ensued, which we will delve into in detail later in this video. For now though, while the passengers remained in their cabins and the ferry's rollover approached and slowly went beyond 60 degrees, the orders to stay put broadcasting over the PA from the guest services desk repeated on a loop until passenger compartments flooded and the PA system presumably ceased to function around 9.52. The waters in this part of the Yellow Sea, a frigid 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 Celsius. From the passenger's perspective, they were given no further instruction nor did they have any idea what was going on outside or in other parts of the vessel. During this time, amongst the confusion, many civilian ships and fishing boats had arrived quickly as well, ready and willing to do anything they could. Captain Lee Jun Sok and his crew were amongst the first and only groups rescued directly from the vessel. One brave adult passenger did gather what few students he could and rushed them up to the exposed decks while a Coast Guard helicopter hovered nearby. Ensuring the helicopter crew saw them, they could not be ignored, and the students were rescued. However, there were otherwise very few people to be found aboard the still exposed starboard side awaiting rescue, and no rescue teams would penetrate any further into the vessel to check for more survivors. In the final moments before totally inverted, the chief communications officer, Dae Hong Yang, two guest service crew members, and a handful of high school teachers helped what few students they could escape the now flooded passenger cabins. At roughly 1017, with the vessel beyond 100 degrees of rollover, roughly 150 to 160 passengers jumped from the inverted decks into the freezing water. The vessel would soon be completely inverted, with only a small portion of the bow exposed. And while grim, difficult, and seemingly impossible, these were still critical moments where rescue could be carried out effectively by trained response teams. No such attempts would be made though, in fact, the sickening actions of the Korean government that day, and the weeks, months, even years to follow, were enough to destroy the credibility, the integrity, of an entire nation's leadership, all in the name of classist authoritarianism and aggressive attempts to prevent public defamation of the hegemony. The MV Seawall, a diesel ferry launched in 94 by Hayashikane Shipbuilding of Japan, started its life as the ferry Naminoe under original owner Oshima Unyu out of Naze, Japan, then purchased in 07 by Japanese A-Line Ferry Company.